Yeah, thanks, Jay, first of all, and the uh, Avalanche team for hosting this. Really cool. First question before we talk about crypto and all these nerdy, nerdy things. Have you had your pastéis de nata yet? And if so, which one is better, the one in Belém or the one in Mantegeria? Belém. Do you even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know the Pache Zenata, right? Belém, for sure. Belém? <laughs> Guys, I'm shocked. You're looking at me like, like I'm a ghost. <laughs> 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 but yeah, all right. So interoperability, I think, is a topic um, that probably is going to be the next big thing, in my opinion, at least, in crypto, for real mass adoption. <laughs> Um, we have four experts here today, and I think before we talk about how they're resolving interoperability with their projects, I think first we can maybe have a little round of short introductions. Um, maybe we can start with you. Um, sure. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm Rahul. I'm one of the co-founders of Connext. We're building interoperability protocols. Been in the space for a long time, since 2017 all through different things, state channels, and now this is the next big thing, cross-chain stuff. So excited to be here, excited to talk to you guys. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Philip. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Lee Finance. Uh, we are a cross-chain bridge aggregation protocol. So what these guys are doing here, we abstract that away, unify the communication, and make sure that um, dev developers don't have to care about which bridge to implement, but rather implement us directly <coughs> and we are like a one inch one for bridges, so to say. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite new in crypto, so beginning this year we joined, um, like co-founder Max and I, we have uh, a long relationship of building ventures together for eight years now, and um, so it was an easy entry for us uh, to join crypto. Felt quite native. Peace. Oh, I forget that CryptoCedo doesn't need any introduction. <laughs> so I'll jump in. I'm Pranay. Uh, I work at C-Labs, and I'm the product lead for Optics which is a new uh, standard for gas-efficient and trust-minimized interoperability. So taking cues from things like IBC, taking the heaviness of a header relay, and introducing some crypto-economic magic to make it a little bit easier to bridge back and forth. And I'm Jay, VP of Marketing at Avalabs, currently working <coughs> on the Avalanche blockchain. That's what we're here for, for right now. Um, and one of the main things that we've been building on the interoperability side is the Avalanche bridge. Just out of curiosity, actually, in this room, who's used the Avalanche Bridge here? All right, so good bridging, everybody. Good bridging. Yeah. GB. Good morning, good bridging. Yeah, GM, GB. <laughs> um, I think Jay is actually the only one who shouldn't have had to introduce himself, because everybody knows you already. Um, but yeah, all I do in crypto is basically, I have a YouTube channel. So CryptoCedo, if you want to follow me there, subscribe to my channel. That's, that's what you can do. <laughs> Um, I don't work in any project, but I'm focused very heavily on Cosmos um, in my coverage, which is also focused very hard on connecting blockchains and ecosystems. So I think it's a good match. Um, but yeah, first off, I think interoperability is a very unattractive term, especially for people that are new to crypto. Um, maybe we can start with Jay, explain it on a very high level what interoperability means to you and why it's so significant in the, in, for the evolution of, of crypto. Yeah, so for me, I'll keep the description pretty simple. For me, interoperability means seamless UX. So anything that you use on crypto or blockchain technology, you shouldn't be able to really understand the, under, the underlying parts of it, or not understand, but actually get kind of caught up in the day-to-day. The, -day. The, the analogy I like to use, especially with Web2, is when we talk about technologies, we're not talking about TCP IP as this breakthrough technology. You're not saying, by the way, guys, TCP IP is going to explode and take over the world. Instead, you guys talk about Uber, or you say, I wish I could get a book from point A to point B and get it delivered immediately to my house. Those are the types of experiences that I think we need to be showing as people that are building the Web3 ecosystem. And again, kind of going back full circle, it's all about seamless UX. Yeah, I think Jay's answer covers the UX and user side of things. Um, my wheelhouse is protocol, so I'll give the compliment on that side, which is in the last, so there's this really great article uh, by USB called The Myth of the Infrastructure Cycle. And it talks about how in crypto, you don't just have one period of laying infra and then build apps all together after that. Rather, it's this like, Texas two-step where you do a little bit of infra building, then you build apps to use that infra, and when they hit their limitation, you have to have another cycle of the infra. 
And so in 2017, we had the scaling cycle where everybody got funding and built out these super scalable new ETH killers or uh, next generation blockchains. Now that those are getting usage, we're realizing that apps can't talk to each other between those chains. So it's time, to, time for another turn of that infra cycle where we focus on connecting those chains and making sure that users can have better experiences across the full network topology. Yeah, and I think, uh, Philip, you're even a step further because what you're trying to do is connecting all interoperability protocols, right? So can you talk a little bit about why you're so excited about about this and also about connecting liquidity pools so that it makes it, makes it easier for users to have access to liquidity and the best rates on different chains. Yeah, so these guys already put it quite well. Um, so user, ex user experience is something that just became much more relevant um, because uh, DeFi just started out one year ago, right? And now um, UX and user onboarding becomes a competitive edge. Um, and uh, we see different blockchains with different technological properties. And uh, like I'm, I'm envisioning a future where people pick their blockchain like you pick a database. There might be a power law where like 70 to 80% is on Ethereum, but there will be a reason for uh, zero knowledge rollups to exist and stuff. So we need bridging. And uh, I think abstracting these things away is important for developers so that they can focus on their value proposition. Uh, right? uh, we are building dApps to solve a problem, a specific one, and by abstracting away the bridging and also the DEXs, um, which is what we do, so we aggregate the bridges by connecting to the DEXs on each chain as well. Um, and in, in that way, we keep that pain off from developers to provide a, user, a good user experience in, in, in that sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and if, um, so like interoperability really is to me, it's abstraction from the user. Like if you think about it, all these chains are just tools. Like when you're going to a farm, you don't care about what chain you're using necessarily, what protocol, you care about the APY. So that's why I'm excited about what Lee Finance is doing, right? Because they can make it so you don't really care. You're just saying you want to swap from one token to another token. You don't care what chain you're using. You could essentially just wrap that all up into one single interface. And uh, if you think about interoperability in terms of Web2, we had these APIs. And back in the day, I think things were much more interoperable. I remember there used to be like a ride share aggregator. Like I used to be able to like ride share, choose what the best price was between Lyft and Uber on one interface. Then they just killed all that because like all these companies killed their APIs and becoming more closed. And blockchain just gives us the opportunity to really open things up. And we have the EVM, which is an interoperability layer by default. And now since we're in this multi-chain world, now, like Pranay said, we've got to get back to actually building these bridges between these chains and give us back the interoperability. Yeah, and I think also what uh, Pranay said about all these layer ones <coughs> gaining adoption now and gaining also like high numbers in TVL, right? I think it's a no-brainer to explore if you start a new project, especially how can we get access to liquidity and users on, on all these chains, not just one, right? Because otherwise you're just missing out on the liquidity and users on another ecosystem. I think it's a no-brainer to at least explore the idea and get rid of this tribal mindset that we used to have in crypto um, over the past few years. But I think now we're at a point where it's kind of like turning around. So that said, uh, can you guys share, maybe we can start with you, um, what um, is the current stage of interoperability in your project? And um, yeah, uh, w maybe some, some timelines uh, also around what, what, what are the next milestones and releases? Yeah, so we kind of built interoperability as a first class citizen in our system. So we built on the EVM. We've deployed to basically like every chain we could. We've spent about a lot of time figuring out all the issues between the chains because they all look the same from an EVM point of view, but they all have their own kind of like different things in terms of like confirmation times. If you look at Polygon Matic, it's like 60 block reorg. So you've got to like take that into account. And what we want to do is we want to make the experience to our users the same no matter what chain they're going to, from, things like that. And also one thing that we're really excited about is the ability to pass call data through our system as well. So that means you can interact from Polygon, let's say, bridge over to Avalanche and like ape into a farm all in the same kind of process to the, to the end user. And the end user doesn't need Avalanche gas, for example, because like, you know, we have this relayer mechanism where they will relay the transaction for you. 
And uh, you know, those are the kind of tools. We want basically interoperability to be the same kind of money Legos that we already get within a monolithic blockchain to be able to do that same kind of thing across blockchains. So that's how we see ourselves as being kind of like this cross-chain Lego. Uh, um, we aim to position ourselves as a middle layer between DeFi infrastructure and the deplication layer. So in that sense, we try to be uh, chain agnostic, <coughs> uh, bridge agnostic, DEX and DEX aggregator agnostic. Um, so uh, we are in close touch with all these bridge builders. Um, so uh, and we, there is a nice article from the Connects team. It's about the interoperability tree lemma. It's uh, written by um, Arjun, uh, one of the co-founders of Connects. And uh, I can highly recommend it. Um, and we see how these different bridges are positioning themselves by focusing on different technical properties. We see them positioning themselves by um, trying their niche in terms of which chain are they bridging to. And it's, it's quite interesting. And we see more and more novel approaches coming up. Also, there are quite different types of bridges, like optics, IBC, uh, connects and hop, but also synthetic asset bridges like Synapse. And they all have different advantages, disadvantages. And uh, it's actually a crazy task to abstract all of that away, because also, as we go into other different ecosystems, we have to uh, hire Rust developers, but also Go developers, uh, Move, and Solidity. So uh, it's, uh, for us, it's a quite a complex task to, to arrange all of that. Yeah, I got a plus one on um, stuff I've learned from the Connects team in Arjun, because he had a good statement, which was, uh, interoperability is not an optimization, it's its own category. And I think we have yet to see that just because it's so damn early. And that frenzy, that zeitgeist around interoperability is here. But for the average user, even a crypto degen, it's tough to know the difference between IBC, Optics, Connext. Connext is a liquidity network, right? It's, it's, it has different properties in that interoperability trilemma relative to something like optics. But because there's such this energy to like ape into a token on another chain, that nuance hasn't yet shaken out. And I think that's fundamentally because the market structure around liquidity is poor right now. It's immature because a lot of the liquidity started out on Ethereum. Ethereum was supposed to be the world computer. How did that work out? Mas o menos, you know, it kind of did its job. But the liquidity is still there, which is why chains like Avalanche, Celo, have all launched incentive programs to kind of pull liquidity and bridge over to these other chains that have a lot of great qualities that users can try out and fall in love with. So I think in the next two to three years, we'll see that liquidity flatten out and go everywhere. And alongside that, the mechanisms by which that liquidity moves will become a lot more precise and nuanced. And everybody will win as a result. Yeah, so what's awesome for me to hear with everybody that's talking about interoperability right now is it seems like we're all in agreement that UX is, is very much kind of the, the holy grail here and we just try and keep pushing the envelope towards that goal. Um, and so for us, we really focused on UX as it relates to existing infrastructure. MetaMask, everyone has positive and probably a little bit negative stories with, with that product. Um, and, but it is one of the most used browser extensions right now. And so lean into something that works, lean into a marketplace that has a lot of users, and then start building from there. And so when you use Avalanche Bridge, you can use MetaMask, and you can connect to Avalanche Network and also Ethereum Network. And when you submit a transaction, all it does is routes the tokens and goes to the same 0x address, but connected to a different network. So if you can think about that with all the other EVMs, and it seems like a lot of us are also in line with the EVM strategy, then horizontally scaling is, is a lot more simple than trying to integrate each and every chain. Instead of just saying that everything is, is working really well and, and everything's going to be OK, I think another challenge maybe to highlight here is composability, mm -hmm. something that I know a lot of us talk about and probably ask ourselves, how do we solve this solution or solve this problem? Curve, um, those types of pools are really good solutions for, for maybe this room, but I don't think it's necessarily a great solution for uh, the, the Coinbase user or the new retail user. And so I think that's where we're trying to really think through, um, maybe amongst all of us to figure out how best to, to attack that problem. Otherwise, I think you're going to get stuck at this level where, like to your point, it's going to be almost like we're trying to optimize things as opposed to this totally new stack where we should probably build it from the ground up. Yeah, and uh, can you expand also a little bit, Jay, on the um, Avalanche Rush program? I think major part of that is also to incentivize 
interoperability and bringing over projects that are on other chains and integrate them to, to Avalanche. Can you talk about what, what's the hottest and latest on that? What's yeah. the stage? Well, I don't know if I can say anything not public, but... Give us if, the alpha, man. Yeah, the Give alpha. Give us the alpha. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. If, if, for those that don't know, Avalanche Rush is, is an incentive program that we've been running for the Avalanche ecosystem. Um, when we announced it, it was roughly around 200 million. Um, if I were to do the math quickly, it's probably at around six, 700 million in, in incentives. And so the question that we get asked, especially with those other ecosystems, Phantom, um, a few others are doing incentive programs, is what happens once the incentives dries up? Um, and that's totally a valid the question. And the, the analogy I like to tend to bring to the table is if you think about ride sharing, ride sharing also has their avalanche rush, or if you want to call it an Uber rush or a Lyft rush, you just don't see it as, as um, I guess, I don't know, fantastically, perhaps. You see it in those $5 increments where if you refer a friend, then you get $5. And it used to be $15 or $20. And of course, those incentives have, have decreased over time, but you still have plenty of users on these platforms. And what that means is there's something that tethers these users to these applications, whether it's a physical experience um, where it's technically more superior, maybe it's a brand, uh, brand kind of affinity and, and you're really attached to, to perhaps Lyft because they have a better brand vision than, than Uber and, and vice versa. And so I think with all of these incentives, it's just really to kickstart all of our ecosystems collectively. It's not really, I mean, it, there is, of course, a little bit of um, overlaps with users. But I think holistically, it's a really good way to get the attention of, of new users and also users that are uh, lower to the funnel. And um, yeah, I guess to, to answer your question, I mean, the latest and greatest is we're continuing to add more and more applications. So if there's, I don't want to call out Luigi. He's somewhere right here. But he's the guy to talk to. So. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> as good as all this sounds, um, there must be also some downsides, some challenges, right, when it comes to connecting chains and ecosystems. Um, and it also takes a long time, right, to realize this. So maybe, Rahul, you can start with sharing some thoughts on the downsides, the challenges, and how you think um, we will tackle this in the, in yeah, the future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think at its core, building like a more trusted system around this is pretty easy. So you can just get like a set of like five validators and be like, okay, you guys verify what goes on in this chain onto this chain. But then you get into all these problems, there's been all these hacks, like a bunch of people have tried this, they've all gotten hacked pretty much. So it's really important that we have to consider all the values of trustlessness, decentralization when we're building these bridges. We don't want to add external verifiers to these systems. We want to actually build the trust on the chains themselves. And that's, that's kind of like what we really value at Connects is we are not adding an extra layer of trust at all. We're sticking with the trust of the system itself. And uh, another big challenge is when you get into this whole asynchronous versus synchronous communication. Like with a blockchain, you get totally synchronous communication. You can take a flash loan, arbitrage something, and then pay back the flash loan the same transaction. You can't do that across chain. Each chain has its own set of like syn synchronous clocks that it's running on. So we kind of have to move away from that thinking that blockchains all have to be synchronous and move back into like the Web2 type experience where you do like a call and a callback, webhook type thing. So that's kind of where I think the challenges are. I think you know, moving into this multi-chain world has kind of like broken the user experience to some extent. Like, I was trying to teach my family, friends, DeFi like a year ago. It was much easier. Now they're like, what's this Polygon, Arbitrum? Like, which one do I go into? Like, oh, but Ethereum's so expensive. So how do I use Avalanche? And so it's crazy. But like, you know, that's, that's the things we really have to come together and try to fix is around the user experience. How do we connect these different chains in a way where it makes sense to users? Yeah, for us, it's especially difficult. I mean, uh, now, I mean, so building bridges is, is incredibly difficult. So whatever they fuck up, it bubbles up to us because <laughs> <laughs> we can basically calculate the best route, right? And what we are exposing to use the user to the underlying risks of the bridges we aggregate. So we have just hired two researchers doing nothing else than assessing uh, um, trust assumptions, attack vectors, really trying to make informed decisions about whom to integrate when, uh, assessing at which stage are these people. Um, optics connects. Like If you look at their learning curve over the past three, four years, it's been an incredible ride. Like, just connects this year, change from a state channel approach to, to an approach that's completely uh, yeah, stateless and, and, and trustless, and it's... it's it's crazy, and uh, we, really have, we really have to make sure that we uh, know <coughs> whom to integrate at, at which point of time. And uh, yeah, so. 
Well, it's, it's reassuring to know that if something goes wrong, you'll be holding the bag too. So I'm glad that uh, we're, we're all in this together. Um, but I, I agree with what both um, Rahul and Philip have said. Like, I think as, as a project that's working on a trust minimized bridge, like it's all a trade off space. Like if you're trying to minimize trust and make it more decentralized, you are giving up either on cost or on latency or speed, right? So it's like whack-a-mole, you hit something, something else pops out. And for an average user, everybody is saying, every bridge is saying we're trustless, we're fast, we're cheap. And it's tough to tell because there's so much damn noise in this space overall. So users are not um, incentivized to use the more secure solutions because they'll have to pay more or wait a little bit longer. And so for the average person, until something black swan like the poly network hack happens, it doesn't come, it's not front and center. And so building for the long term is especially challenging in this space when you see folks that are building for the near term get rewarded handsomely. But I think if you are set on playing long term games and seeing the space out for the next 10, 20 years, building the more trustless and secure solution is going to be the thing that lasts. So that's, I think, the first problem right in front of us. The second problem that I'm concerned about is because there is this proliferation of bridges, there's also a proliferation of representations or wrapped assets. So one of the things that may not be like immediately visible is that the metaphor bridging is fundamentally flawed. You're not getting in your car and driving across a bridge. You're driving to the bridge, parking your car, walking across, and renting another car at the other side. And if you try and return your Hertz rental to Avis, you're screwed. You can't. You got to go back to Hertz. So sorry for my American rental car metaphors. I, I hope it's landing. Um, <laughs> but that, that is going to be a much bigger problem as the liquidity on different chains increases. And we need to find a way to consolidate that liquidity. And so I think Philip is going to feel this as well when, um, when Lee is routing people based on the bridge. Do the people want X USDC, Y USDC, Z USDC? Or do you have to get there and then use a stable swap to switch between them? So I think that'll emerge as a big problem. But right now, we're just focused on building bridges that don't burn. So we'll get there. It's maybe actually a question for you and anyone else who has um, opinions on the wrapped asset topic. Curious, do you think it has to be clear on the protocol level, or can the front end kind of obscure it a little bit, where you have all the synthetics, but then uh, to the kind of untrained eye, it just says USDC? Or do you think it has to be um, on the protocol level? Y'all want to go first, or you want me to take it? I mean, I think due to the fact that there are going to be all these multiple representations, and the, to get efficient with multiple representations, you need more liquidity. So I think that is going to basically end up starting like a war between them. And then like Philip and I have been talking about this, the space is going to consolidate more and more. And some of these bridges will just die because they don't have liquidity to support their multiple wrapped asset versions. So, I think in the end, that's probably a good thing because it will kind of make things easier for users in the end. And like, you know, you could end up going with something that works best in the end, like something like Optics versus something like, you know, Poly Network or whatever, which had some random set of validators that just all, you know, like it went through the floor. So I think, yeah, in the end, it will end up consolidating. But yes, it is going to be a big problem. You know, at Connects, we just trade liquidity that's already on the chain, so we don't do a bridged asset. So it's kind of like we can work together with you guys and, and come up with the best thing. Uh, I, I can imagine like a whole subset of DeFi products that are just betting on wrapped assets, as we also, let's talk about NFTs, for example. Like, it's impossible to bridge NFTs in that atomic way, right? So uh, at that point, um, there might be a market for wrapped assets that then inter, like, interconnect or in, like, work together with um, wrapped NFTs in that sense. And there could be a whole suite, or a suite of products um, um, coming up. Um, I see that. I'm wondering who's going to make the first uh, yeah, wrapped NFT move. Um, we see a couple of synthetic asset bridges coming up now. Um, and I'm guessing they've made an informed decision on that as well. As we talk to them, as you already mentioned, like hey, it's really like, they're all saying the same. We are safe, we are fast, um, we are sustainable. So uh, it's a lot of uh, doing your own research um, regarding that. Yeah, but um, excited to, um, to what's about to come. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question because the answer is 
por que no los dos, right? Why not both? In the, in the near term, uh, we'll have UX fixes. Like it's kind of like duct tape where you use the stable swap. And then without the user necessarily having to know, you will route into the right wrapped asset or the representation that the DeFi app that they're using uh, is, is looking for, right? But there are a lot of issues with this, and one that Rahul hinted at is that it's extremely capital inefficient because you have to have enough of both assets, both representations, in the stable swap in order to be able to switch between them. Um, the other thing is the security properties of these might be wildly different, right? So, and that's dependent on the bridge. And if I'm the user, I want to use the most secure representation. So I do think the long-term solution will emerge at the protocol level, but I'd love to see something like um, a coalition where uh, a wrapped asset, a canonical address for a wrapped asset may be the winner, but multiple bridges can mint and burn from it at the same time, right? Now you're kind of, um, you're coupling the security of all the bridges that have like the burn or mint rights to that contract, but that's better for the user with a little bit of security trade-off. Um, but we are exploring different ways here to work with bridges to consolidate that liquidity, and I hope to solve it at that level in the long run, because I think that's the only way you have the best user experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, guys. Anything to add to that, Jay? Um, I don't want to repeat term? the same <laughs> no, that's things, fine then. but I mean, maybe one other thing is, from, from our perspective, one thing that has been work, working really well is our airdrop function for the Avalanche Bridge, especially if you show up to it's kind of like the rental car uh, analogy. If you show up to the rental car with the wrong currency, you're not going to be able to use that rental car um, mm. service. And so instead, it, a lot of pro protocols that are building bridges should make sure that, again, that experience is as frictionless as possible. So with Avalanche Bridge, if you come with an Ethereum asset, you transfer the assets over, then you actually get the Avalanche gas fees subsi subsidized. And so you actually don't have to go to an exchange and hold both ETH and Avalanche tokens to spend on those gas fees. And I think that's a tiny choice that we made that allows us to, to really onboard a lot more people into the ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's a small thing, but it improves the user experience so much, so it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, what do you think is the, the future of interoperability going to look like? Um, and also re refer to your projects that you're working on. Is there anything exciting that you can I don't know, share, announce, or leak. Yeah, I mean, I think the future, like the present is showing that the future is multi-chain. Like we're not gonna get to a point where one layer one wins everything. And even in the case, okay, if you do say you're a Ethereum maxi or whatever, and you're like, Ethereum is gonna win everything, the only way Ethereum is gonna scale is with multi-chain. Like roll-ups are chains in the end. Like L1 sharding is gonna look like multi-chain. So these are problems that we have to solve no matter what. And I'm so glad that we're solving it now in this multi-chain world because these are the problems that are gonna solve the harder like layer one scaling problems in the end. So, um, you know, in the future, that's, we're just gonna solve more and more of these problems. We're trying to work with more and more people. Like, you know, I, I do wanna collaborate more with Optics as like a base layer messaging protocol while we take care of the liquidity layer on top. And then of, of course, collaborate with people like Lee Finance who are doing the user experience. Like one of my dreams with, you know, Lee Finance that I've always thought about is being able to split your order across multiple chains. So like, you know, once we can get to that point where that user experience is like so seamless, you know, you choose your, you get like really low slippage rates by like routing through multiple chains, whatever. And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where we're going in the future and we're trying to build the blocks to get to that future. So, yeah. Yeah, we're already talking a lot about abstraction. Um, it's, uh, so thank you. I'm a magic, like I just copied that. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk, don't want to talk too much more about abstraction. Uh, what I'm excited about is that um, I'm coming from Web 2.0 and if you build a software as a service, like you put together so many APIs and third-party providers um, in, 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 in all directions to build your product, to do your marketing, marketing automations, whatsoever. And uh, we have that composability factor in, uh, in crypto as well. So uh, what's next is that uh, we will see more, I would say, front-end interoperations. Will be, it will be a lot about uh, improving the user experience and the user journey. And as that space becomes, as that space becomes more competitive, uh, I'm really excited about being one of the first projects that uh, will allow dApps to get a competitive advantage over the others, because the one dApp that integrates us doesn't have to send away their users 
to bridges and DEXs and DEX aggregators, but they can convert them directly, uh, while others um, will have a very friction-rich user experience. So it, it creates a new, um, yeah, a new paradigm to think about uh, uh, actually competition. Yeah, I think it's, it's getting, going more competitive. Also, as liquidity is fragmenting and there are so many new farms and protocols, options protocols, future protocols on different chains, uh, it's, it's getting competitive on many different layers and levels. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what I find exciting right now. Yeah, I think um, my answer is, comes in two parts. The first is, as I mentioned earlier, around liquidity. I think liquidity will smooth out, and it'll look less like Ethereum as Rome with all roads leading to it, right? Like, I think uh, right now, most of the traffic is from Ethereum to another EVM chain like Avalanche or Celo. But I would love for Avalanche and Celo to have more commerce directly rather than having Ethereum as kind of the, the hub and spoke model. And, and that's, that's kind of an artifact of how the space evolved. And so I think that liquidity will go everywhere else. And there will be a, the, the, that graph will be uh, connected in a way that other nodes have a lot more weight than just Ethereum and a couple other big ones. The second bit is like um, towing off of what these guys were talking about around abstractions. I think the wallet, like MetaMask or other wallets, will start abstracting away what chain your tokens live on, right? Like, again, that is an artifact of looking too close at the chain and starting off on Ethereum and then having more chains pop up. At the end of the day, provided that the baseline security is enough, like, maybe I don't want to park my car on Skid Row, but I'm fine with it being in Santa Monica or Beverly Hills. Again, Amer America-centric metaphors, apologies. But as long as your car is not in a bad neighborhood, you're f you don't really care where it is. It's still your car. And so in the same way, I think the wallet will show you the tokens you own. And whenever you want to use a cool app, you won't really care what other chain it's on. You'll, under the hood, the wallet will use LeFi to route you into the liquidity network using Connext into the representation wherever you need to get that liquidity. And then under the hood, hopefully those representations are minted using optics. And so you'll be able to use an app on Celo, Avalanche, Ethereum, anywhere, and just use a cool app without caring what chain you're on. That's, that's where we're headed. For me, I'll, I'll take a, a little bit of a different approach on the answer. Maybe go towards more on the marketing and communication side of things. Um, for, for I think most of us, we've been telling the story of blockchain over and over and over. I bet you that story has changed tremendously from the first time you told your friend or family what blockchain is all the way to now based on what makes most sense to that end user. So for us right now, we're, we're kind of using the word bridges. We might be using the the phrasing of the rental cars. But I remember three, four years ago, the, the, the whole market of interoperability projects or bridges was just called, it wasn't called anything. People were just calling it, hey, this is, this is just a project for interoperability. So what excites me most is, what does this story look like in the end? Perhaps it's a story where we actually don't even have to talk about it too much, like all of us are kind of hinting at, it seems. And, and I think maybe after, after this panel, I think we should probably think of a, a side project to work on all, as, as kind of the four or five of us. We have a lot of interest, in, especially in abstraction. I think um, ultimately that's, that's really what excites me is almost nothing at all to do with bridges. All right, and as we wrap this panel up, um, can everybody share maybe a final piece of advice for everybody that is maybe relatively new to crypto um, to not get lost in this DeFi crypto jungle, uh, what would be the, the number one thing that you would say, hey, um, this is from my experience that you know, I could give on, on your path, where we can start? Don't use a random bridge. I mean, I guess I got to <laughs> keep it relevant, but like, you know, I think James Prestwich has written about this a lot too. It's like the bridge is like, you know, the, the bridge ends up being your lifeline to all these different chains. So if you use a shitty bridge, you're going to like end up saying bye to your funds. So. <laughs> I, and this is really hard, especially for like users that don't know about this stuff. How do they know which bridge they're using? In the end, they're going to look for the cheapest, fastest bridge. Like users don't care. Like like you said, also they don't care unless it hits them in the wallet. So, you know, people are going to learn this the hard way, unfortunately. But this is this is a really important piece, and this is something we need to solve, and we need to figure out how to make it more clear to the users. Yeah, I, I agree on that. And before you even think about a bridge, uh, maybe just. Sit down with a friend, go on CoinGecko, uh, let, let them get them explain you like the first 20 uh, chains, 
<laughs> and then opt in for one ecosystem and stay there. Don't FOMO out into different areas. You're just going to lose money. Just stick within one ecosystem, learn the different kinds of protocols, and then think about an educative decision which bridge should take or go to live finance. <laughs> <laughs> Don't chase APYs. Yeah, Don't chase that's, that's APYs. Don't chase the <laughs> what would be your, your advice? Oh, mine's simple. Don't buy Cardano. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and mine, to close, would be ask yourself if you really need to use a bridge. I know that's kind of ironic since we're all talking about bridges right now, but maybe there's a better route. Um, if you don't have assets stuck on an ecosystem, perhaps there's another, another way until, uh, until we improve the experience, perhaps. Awesome, yeah, I think uh, we can wrap it up here. Um, if you have questions to all the panelists. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, uh, so when we're looking at, can, is this a good volume? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when we're thinking about security and, and design decisions, and we're aggregating in, on, the one cent, in, on the one hand, maybe we just want to abstract that away from the users. But you know, users might prioritize just speed and, and cost effectiveness. But the, you know, and there's a tail risk, a very real and like dangerous risk, um, and th based on security. So like, if we want to abstract it away, can we just kind of lean them toward more like users who don't really care to pay attention toward a more secure way with an aggregator? And then also for those who do care, is there a way for them to start to evaluate things in a meaningful way? That's a two parts, sorry. Yes, uh, so multiple things. So first of all, one of the things we do in general is, uh, as I said, we have two research just elaborating, diving deep into these bridging solutions. We will line out that knowledge into a huge knowledge base. So we are going to have one central place where you can turn to and inform yourself about all these bridges. We're going to compare them. Uh, maybe you have uh, read the article from Dimitri from 1KX. He has, he has uh, given, uh, he's, they are our lead investor. They did a great. Uh, job in, uh, in uh, elaborating on all these bridges. Um, we have a default prioritization pattern, which is security over speed over cost, because we are saying the assumption is that people are willing to pay for security and user experience right now, because they're already used to pay high fees. An integration partner that integrates our SDK can change that pattern. He can be like, uh, you know what, um, I prefer a cost over speed over security, but I'm going to blacklist this particular bridge because I don't trust them. So we also have blacklisting, whitelisting, prioritization patterns. Maybe gray listing so that you could say like danger, but if you really want to push through, you can. Uh, yeah, we might do that. Right now it's the plan. Yeah, we, we, we might do that, but we rather tend to want to abstract that away and then just make a decision on the user's behalf. But that being said, also on the widget level for the user, we're going to suggest the best route, but there is an advanced options menu f for advanced users. They can say, show me alternative routes, and they can make their own decisions, right? Uh, we even plan to um, 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 reflect these settings in the local storage of the user's browser. So once you have changed the settings once, it's going to be applied everywhere, wherever you go and use the Lee Finance widget. Um, uh, assessing security is incredibly hard, as you said. And uh, even, though, even though with the best intentions in mind, you also have to uh, uh, see how reliable has that bridge working in the past, has it been auditing or audited or not, and even signals like who invested, who is part, who is advising, how much knowledge, how much, like how shady, risk. how shady is it? Yeah. Uh, like is it a pump and dump uh, gremium <laughs> behind it? That might also be a security factor we will um, opt in into, the, yeah, which we will encounter in the past, uh, in, the, in the future. It's, it's very early and uh, lots of work to do. Yeah, it's a lot of work, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and if I could jump, go ahead. I just wanted to jump in quick also. Like, uh, I would suggest you read Arjun's article as well on, yes. uh, from Connects because he lays out there's only, there's only really three types of bridge designs it's like externally verified or natively verified. So if you can put the bridge you're trusting into one of those designs, then you know automatically what you're risking, what the risk is. Like, even if you look at the Polygon POS bridge, the stake that the bridge has is much less than the volume that they have. So like, it's literally in their interest to rug pull the entire bridge. But of course, you know, they have reputations and stuff like that, so they probably won't do that. But like, you, know, you should know that as a user, that what you're trusting and you know, what the incentives are and if they're aligned against you. 
Yeah, just to add, I think um, what both of these guys said is extremely valid, but it also reflects how early we are, right? So like, if you're Rahul or Gavin or Dimitri, it's, it's possible for you to go read on the security models of bridges and make an informed decision. But my friends aren't doing that, or my non-crypto friends are not doing that. So I think for them, what LeFi is doing is, is the near-term solution, is being that like Yelp for bridges, right? Telling you like, what, what is the five-star bridge versus what is the one-star bridge with roaches that the health inspector saw, right? So um, that, that, I think, is what we need when there's this proliferation of different bridges. But I think, in, again, thinking about the long term, we haven't talked about Cosmos at all uh, or Polkadot, but the reason for that is because they have standards. Cosmos has IBC, Polkadot has XCM, and we don't have this problem because those standards are vouched for, they're used by all the chains, and all the UX tools, the wallets, everything automatically plugs into those standards. So it's like a, pulling a textbook from Web 2 and all of human history, have a standard, right? Have something that people know they can trust because it's used by everybody and it's vouched for and it has a good design. But we're at the stage where it's like that XKCD comic, there are 13 standards, I disagree with all of them, hmm. so I'm creating the 14th. So while we wait for that to shake out, we're going to have all these issues. But I do think there will be a standard for the EVM world. And it's going to be up to folks like Avalanche and Cello and everybody else that's part of that community to agree on that and decide what is the thing that's going to be here for the long run. And uh, I have a horse in the race, but I won't talk my book right now. I have one more thing to say. As you mentioned, the one keyword is standardization. And uh, I just want to mention it for everyone who's building a bridge. There is chain agnostic improvement proposals, and it's very important that we get these people, uh, that we get, get all these bridge builders together and develop standards in terms of APIs, uh, how to communicate certain security threats and stuff like that. So uh, we also need to make sure that we are interoperable with each other, so to say. So uh, yeah, chain agnostic improvement proposals, like uh, this is something to come, and we, we need to work on that. Yeah, and I guess the horse you have in the race is not Cardano. It's I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes? Here, in the red shirt. Hi, guys. My name is Alex, and I'm basically building one of the bridges, which is called D-Bridge. And I want to raise point getting back to the blacklisting of bridges because in my opinion, uh, users do not bear that much risk because the only risk they bear is the risk on the interval of validation of transactions, right? Sometimes it's more or less equal to the finality in the blockchain where the transaction was originated, some, sometimes a bit more. But the main risk here is on uh, liquidity providers who provide liquidity in the target chain. So why does it make sense to blacklist bridge for user? Why like blacklisting of bridge makes sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when when I bridge asset, I actually I don't want to receive the wrapped asset in the target chain. I want to instantly swap it to somewhere. So basically, if I already swapped, I don't bear any risk. And uh, oh, blacklisting can be important because let's say we have uh, 200 DApps integrated us, and then some someone gets hacked, like Poly Network. So we need to be able to, with the change of a parameter, without having to redeploy the whole protocol, to be able to blacklist a certain bridge at that point. Yeah, and be like, all right, blacklist Poly Network until they are up and running again, and then it could be. Yeah, but that's only on the risk on those protocols or dApps who integrated uh, your wrapped asset. And that's basically their own risk, because they, take, they took the decision to work with this bridge with these specific wrapped assets. So I mean, it doesn't make sense to blacklist bridges on the aggregation level. You just need to find like the best rate for user for swapping. What I don't get the question. Could you could repeat the question and maybe the microphone a little down? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, oh, yeah, <laughs> now it's better. So I I was saying that DApps for integrating bridges they're actually taking this risk because they made a decision to work with your wrapped asset. And as a user, I I I don't care about wrapped asset. I want just to receive the target desired asset on my wallet. So when you're blacklisting from some users, it doesn't make really sense because the main risk is on liquidity providers who provide liquidity into liquidity pools in the target chain. Uh, so, so you're just saying, just to re you're just saying that um, it's it's it just so you're saying wrapped assets are just risky because uh, 
um, there has to be enough liquidity and so the user doesn't face any, any further risk. Is yeah, yeah, I tried to say that blacklisting of bridges from user doesn't make that much sense because the only risk they bear is on the time interval of transaction validation. And the main risk here is on liquidity providers who provided liquidity in the target chain. That, that's what I meant. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's like you can debate whether it's right or wrong to blacklist, but if you own distribution, you own the users. So again, coming back to the Yelp metaphor, if you know anything about Yelp, they, they're not the uh, most savory company, right? But they control the users. So. Yeah, it's uh, the same thing like one inch. Do one inch blacklist any of the liquidity pools in their protocol? It's a little bit different, though, because bridges have different properties. You have to factor in asynchrony, as Rahul was mentioning. And the security of how that wrapped asset, how the canonical assets are custodied, is different across bridges. So you can't just punt to the liquidity provider. I, I think what you're saying is that the risk of the blacklist falls onto the liquidity provider, not yeah. the user, correct? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But okay. I think in some cases that might not always be the case. Like if your bridge gets rug pulled, like while you're in the middle of a transaction or something like that. So maybe there are some bridge designs where the user does actually get. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. When I, what I said, that user basically bears risk only on the time interval of transaction value. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, then that, that also makes sense. So we should, the liquidity providers need like another blacklist to look at. So maybe yeah. Leaf Finance could have like a Yelp for liquidity providers for bridges <laughs> rather than users of bridges. Good point. <laughs> yeah. Another so, question? If I can maybe add something to that, that could maybe something, because we're also building a bridge at, and we could work for something like the finance is, um, because the hardest thing about the liquidity provision is no insurance provider right now wants to um, insure bridges because the risk premium would just be way, 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 way too high. But if, for example, a provider like LeFi could aggregate all these bridges and then we pool together the insurance between 10 or 20 or 30 different bridges, the premium will go down. And we, that's something we should, as all bridge providers, should work together on so we can insure our liquidity providers for a premium that doesn't make it completely economically inviable to do that. Sounds like a token idea. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually, uh, I can't say too much, but that's actually something we have thought about um, for a long time already. So um, trying to, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of ideas on how to, for example, rebalance bridges and liquidity pools as we're integrated in the dApps. We can anticipate future liquidity flows um, just by, da by data analysis, right? So we could uh, make sure to rebalance the right bridges and dexes in time. Uh, also, ensuring cross-chain bridges, uh, cross-chain bridge terms acts or something, something else. Uh, there are many things we can do, but uh, as it's so early, uh, we aim for product market fit first and then see. So also there's no token yet. Uh, so um, yeah, we're just focusing on product market fit, solving a problem, and then we can uh, develop a token model together that might, be al might also tap into the business models of the underlying uh, bridges. Um, this is also something. Uh, yeah, to do. All right, is there any other questions or comments from any of you on the stage? Jay, any final words? All right, so yeah, then thanks for joining, and I guess you'll be around, so if any questions, then you can also talk to the guys. So yeah, thanks. thanks.